All right, everybody, we're back. Ah, man, that was quite a little lunch there. I'm ready to go now. I'm ready to take a nap. Uh, don't forget today's highlighting of today's lesson is going to be which way is more effective in the way we pour the oil. So we've got sideways, somebody said, this way, that way, poke a hole in it and spray it out. Stay tuned. All right, guys, uh, we left off on oil uh, viscosity, and we said viscosity was uh, the oil's ability to flow, the oil's ability to flow. It's actually the resistance to flow. So high viscosity oils are thick. So if I put Mrs. Butterworth in the refrigerator, she's going to be very thick, and when we pour her out, she's going to say, oh, no, I'm so cool. All right, so that's high viscosity. Low viscosity oils uh, flow freer. So if we put Mrs. Butterworth in the microwave, heat that liquid up, she's going to come out of the bottle and pour right out. So the same principle applies, of course, uh, to oils. And we're going to see how that comes up uh, in a little bit when we go to the board. So anytime we say low viscosity oil, Temperature must have an effect on it. It has something to do with temperatures. So any of you guys into cooking, if you're into cooking, uh, let's see, uh, what type of oil is the healthiest to cook with? Let's say you got to put some oil in a skillet. Olive oil? Yeah, probably an olive oil. If you go to the store, you'll see certain uh, stores. Man, they got like 50 different olive oils you could purchase, all different types. All right, suppose I want to fry some chicken. Will olive oil work if I'm frying chicken? No. Mm -mm. It, it's, it's temperature rating is a lot different. So we have a tendency to use vegetable oils. They handle the heat differently. So the way uh, the oils handle heat and how thick they are during that heat, that is related to viscosity, how it flows. So look what, what happens. If you put oil in your pan, think of it as olive oil, and we heat the oil up too much, that oil basically gets to a smoke point where it literally turns into smoke, right? So we don't want the oil in an engine to overheat. That would affect something. And then what about if the oil is really cold? That affects something. So putting the wrong oil in your engine will affect it whether, whether it's hot or cold. And so we have to get the right number based on what the manufacturer says. Otherwise, if, think about it. If that oil is too cold, uh, maybe I shouldn't say it that way. If the oil is not the correct thickness, not the correct viscosity, then when it is cold, that oil is not going to flow to the parts like it should. Let's look at it that way. All right, here we go. Engine manufacturers, they're the ones who determine it, not you. OK, so you got to watch it because you may go to a quick oil place. Right. And the guy there has been changing oil for five years. Uh, by the way, um, you're going to Lincoln Tech and you shouldn't be changing oil. For five years. Right. You should be moving up. We're trying to get you to move up. You're being a technician. Uh, uh, so uh, not an oil changer forever. So a guy changing your oil may be very good at changing your oil but he may not know a lot about the qualities of that oil like you're learning today, okay? So different oils do different things at different temperatures and take a look at who takes care of this for us. Can't you put um, you know, can What you is put, that? I'm sorry, go ahead. Can you put like different uh, oil in your car depending on like the weather? Say if it's gonna be hotter, you could put like a 5W like 40 or like a 5W30 instead of a 5W20 when like during the winter and stuff? Uh, as a general rule, I'll probably say no to that question. I'd probably say no. However, the answer is probably yes. For a regular consumer, it's no way because they're changing their oil based on the light or based on a sticker. And so they could literally put a uh, thin, thin weight oil in there. And then two days later, it's really, really cold outside. And then that would affect something. That, that, that's actually a big deal. So as a general rule, the answer is no. You stick with what the manufacturer says. However, 
Um, people in Florida, it's a little different. In Florida, we don't expect temperatures to go below zero. So in that case, it, it would be different. Uh, I was looking at a Mercedes manual one time, and it gave choices as to what the customer could do. And I think they had like three different choices from what I remember. I want to say zero W20 could go in, which is thinner than a 5W30. And so either one would work. So it, it kind of depends. Um, for us as technicians, I guess we can make up our own minds because we're kind of supposed to be experts at what we can do. In my day, um, my dad used an oil that was a summer grade oil. My dad was a postman. He delivered mail for a living. And my father always used his own personal station wagon. We always had station wagons because he would carry the mail in it. And by him using his own personal car, uh, he got like an extra, I don't know, 100 bucks a week uh, for using his own car. So he wanted that extra money. So in the summertime, my dad would get a summertime oil change. And a summertime oil change in the old days meant we put a thick oil in for summer. Then at the end of summer, right around uh, for end of summer, think of it as like October, uh, he would put a thinner oil in for the winter time, and he just swore that was the proper way to do it. So different people do different things. The only problem is with today's high-performance cars, variable valve timing, turbocharging, and tighter engine tolerances, you can't play games. You have to be right. If you put too thick of an oil in there, even if it's summertime, that oil may not get to the components fast enough, and you're going to accelerate your wear. The worst thing that can happen, guys, is dealing with newer cars. Wrong oil in a newer car, and then if any type of engine damage occurs, that car is under warranty. Once they figure out the wrong oil has been installed, the consumer would lose the warranty on his engine. I mean, he'd have to pay for that. And then he'll, he'll come after you because you said, hey, put this oil in there. All right? So good question. Very, very good question. So take a look at my uh, PowerPoint here. And in my PowerPoint, it says Society of Automotive Engineers, okay? And they started back in 1911, and they're the ones who standardize lots of things. So you've probably heard of SAE before. And one of the things they do uh, has to do with all uh, engine oils. And all manufacturers require that you use an oil that's been tested by the Society of Automotive Engineers so that your warranty can be honored. And I'm not kidding, guys. You could literally go in an old gas station somewhere and buy oil in a bottle that you wouldn't want to pour in your lawnmower. So you want to make sure we're pouring good stuff in there. So the Automotive Society of Auto Engineers, they test oils at two different temperatures to see how that oil flows. So one of the flow tests is called a winter test. And that simply means that the oil is going to be at temperature zero Fahrenheit. And at temperature zero, they're going to see how that oil flows at temperature zero. And then that gets a low number, and that's called a winter test. So I guess my first question to you is, what does the W stand for in the oil? If we're saying 5W30. Okay, the survey says, somebody says winter. Anybody else? Winter, one, winter. another one says weight. So five weight 30 or five winter 30. Very good, very good. The answer is W, winter. Winter, the oil has been tested at a winter temperature, and that's why it has the W there. The W means winter. So I always say weight because I'll say, hey, I'm using 30 weight oil, but 30 weight has nothing to do with the W that's in there. W means winter test. So 5W30 is a winter oil, and it's also a summer oil. Your oil is tested in two temperatures, zero degrees and also 210 degrees. So how does the oil flow at 210 degrees? How does the oil flow at zero degrees. That's what these guys do. So when they do the winter test, in fact, we're getting ready to do the test on the board in a couple of minutes here. When they do the winter test, the oil is basically um, 
poured into a viscous meter, and that viscous meter can tell and calculate how much oil is flowing at a certain time. And if it's giving the W, it is a cold rated oil. So you'll see numbers like 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. And they'll have the W after it, simply meaning the oil was tested for winter use. And I guarantee you this, if you're using a 20-weight oil and they're asking you to use zero-weight oil, you're probably going to damage that engine, especially a modern engine. And once again, zero-weight is thin oil at temperature zero, and 20-weight oil is much thicker than a zero, so a 20W is tested at winter, but it's thicker than a zero. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Makes some sense to me. <laughs> so the W, once again, represents winter test at temperature zero. All right, let's go to some heat. Okay, if we put heat on the oil, okay, we're basically going to heat this oil up to 210 degrees and see what it flows, right, see what it flows at. And then it gets that summer number to it. So if you look at it, 20 can be a winter grade and a summer grade. It's kind of interesting. So a 20 uh, at the end of that bottle represents it was tested at temperature 210 degrees, and it flows at this rate. Okay, look at the last one there, 60. 60 represents the thickest oil as it flows at 210 degrees. And you better not have any 60 in your car. I don't think anybody would use 60 unless you're like into racing and performance and that sort of thing. So it's, it's pretty interesting. So they do a um, viscosity test. They use some time. They run it through a bottle. They heat the oil up. And they see how much comes out. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, I think we can do this right now. So let's head over uh, to the board. And let's go do a viscosity test. Uh, let's see. I'll get off the presenting part. Make, uh, make the screen a little bigger for you, I think. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right. Back from lunch. All right, so here's my uh, visco meter, my viscosity meter here. And on my little meter here, uh oh, I got to move my uh, camera over so I can see myself. I'm uh, making sure I'm standing in the right spot. I think I am. All right, there we go. <clears throat> so I've got my little viscous meter here. And in my viscous meter, Society of Automotive Engineers, we're going to pour a quart of oil. And when we pour a quart of oil, we're going to time it. And as we time that oil, it goes through the meter, and then we calculate how quickly it flows at 210 degrees, and then we give that a number. So our first test in my example here is we're doing a hot test. So this is for summer grading. And depending on how many uh, liters or milliliters have flowed out of this thing, we now calculate a number. So there we go. I'm saying that when I tested this oil at 200 degrees, timed it for so many seconds, this oil is a 40. So a 40 weight oil is, of course, going to be thicker than a 20 weight, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So let's change the oil. I change the oil. This is a 20 weight. 20 weight flows through quicker and fills my little tank up quicker. So since this flows faster, that oil is thinner. And a thinner oil will now take a lower number for viscosity. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, let's test the oil at temperature zero. If we test the oil at temperature zero degrees Fahrenheit, we are now going to change what this is. So what are my low numbers, guys? Can you give me some low numbers? I'm going to change the hot numbers here. Zero. Okay, zero. 
Five. Five. Ten. Ten. Twenty. Sixteen. Twenty. Uh, I don't think we're going higher. Oh yeah. Any, any higher. Because remember, if we're testing, if we're testing at temperature zero, all of these numbers are really going to be W's now. Yeah. Yeah, because we're interested in flow rate at temperature zero. So now my, my viscous meter is set at temperature zero. We're going to pour the oil through, see how fast it comes through, calculate the time. And this oil comes through like Mrs. Butterworth. So we pour the oil in, and this is so cold, it goes drip, 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 drip. Oh, it's so cold in that viscous meter. I'm coming out very slow today. All right, so if it came out slow, what number would you give it? A five. On the scale here. Zero. No. No, no, no. It came, Mrs. It came out slow. 20. 20. It came oh, out really, 20. really slow. It came out really, really slow. Okay. Now, we're going to change the oil. It's not Mrs. Butterworth. It's something else. Temperature zero is what it is. Okay. I pour it through. I'll tell you in advance what it is. It's mobile one. Today's engines require mobile one. All right. So it's mobile one. I pour it through and whoosh, it flies right through. It's mobile one. Zero. Yeah, zero. we got a zero weight oil. Okay. W does not mean weight. It means I tested it at zero. It flowed and filled up my container very quickly. I've got zero weight oil. And that is how the oil is tested. Believe me, boys, you got a turbocharger. You're going to have a very low first number. Okay. I can't even think of it. Maybe a couple of you guys can if you know. I don't think there's any turbo engines running around today that require 10 W30. Does anybody know? I actually don't. They're all running like zero, no, at least for BMWs. They're definitely running a lot of zero W30s. Uh, I've seen that. Okay. But that first number can't be a 10. And that first number can be a 20. Castro has a famous oil out. Uh, we used in my day called 20W50. 20W50 is some very thick oil. You, you're not putting that in your car today. <laughs> I guarantee you you're not. And uh, I'm interested in turbochargers and tight engines. Hey, guys, um, as I told you before, one of the biggest problems we have in our industry is people buying used cars. And when they buy used cars, there's all type of defects in them. And one of the worst defects you can have in an engine that uh, basically is a new, a new used car purchase is somebody puts the wrong oil in there on purpose, on purpose, especially in the summertime. So it's time for story time. So we got a young man um, working uh, with us at Pep Boys, and he's uh, changing oil, and a customer brings in like a, a Jeep Liberty. Look, look okay. And while he's changing the oil, he calls us over. Hey, guys, take a look at this. And he opens up the plug, and the oil is coming out like Mrs. Butterworth syrup on a very cold day. And this is in the middle of summer. So we collected some of the oil so that we can show the customer. And we basically put the oil in a cup. You tell me what this oil is when I tell you what it smelled like. The oil had a very pungent smell to it. It smelled very similar to natural gas. Diesel. Stink. It stink. Diesel will not come out thick. Diesel comes out thin. Diesel comes out thin. So good guess. The oil was very, very thick. Blackish in color, black, bluish in cover, color, and it stinked real nasty. You have smelled this before. Not more oil. You have smelled this before. Okay, I'll write the number of it on the board, and then you tell me what oil this is when I write the number up. So the number of the oil would have been... Good. 
You suck. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kill, kill the mic there. Kill the mic there, guys. I can hear your personal business. Okay, the oil was 80 W90. What oil do you think would be an 80 W90? I didn't hear that, but I heard some mumbling. A semi or a train or... Oh, you all, I'm telling you, you already know this oil. It stinks real bad. Uh, gear oil. You got it. It's gear lube. Gear lube. Weren't you in a class called TDL? This is gear lube. Oh, yeah. Gear lube actually stinks. And the bottle has a point to it so I can pour this into your car, which is we put this in transmissions. And, yes, they're testing the oil cold, and they give it an 80 number. Now, there'll be no 80 in a car engine. That's, that's crazy. This oil is coming out like honey, thick as honey. So an 80-weight oil or 80W90, that is thick oil that normally goes inside of a differential. And if you ever smelled gear fluid or rear end fluid, it, it just smells nasty. It's a, it's, a, it's a funny smell. I don't like it. I don't like the smell. All right, let's get back to the story. So we drain this oil out of this guy's Jeep, and the oil's real thick. As soon as we smell it, all the mechanics know that this engine has gear lube in it. So look what little Johnny did. Little Johnny found the Jeep Liberty on Craigslist. He goes over there. Guy runs it, runs good, tests it, sounds good, blah, blah, blah. He buys it. Now he brings it to us for his first oil change, and we're draining gear lube out of the engine. Now, what do you think the problem is going to be when we take 80W90 out, and now we have to put in what, it, what is required, which is 5W30? Going to rod knock. This engine is going to rock, meaning... The oil that was so thick in that engine, it took up space. And when that oil took up space, any loose parts in the engine are now hidden. Because the oil is so thick, the parts don't bang into each other. It's, a, it's kind of an ingenious move if you're a crook. Okay? I don't want my mama buying a vehicle like that. Now, when we pour the correct oil in there, the engine starts clacking it, clack, 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 making all type of goofy noises. And guess what your customer is going to think? You did it. He's going to think you did this. Then he sues the shop. It's a new car. Well, he's not going to sue. I mean, I got a cup of oil. I can prove what came out of it. But I guarantee you this. He is going to try to accuse us of doing something when in reality it was the previous owner who put the deceptive chemical in the crankcase. And now when we fix it right, this problem now shows up. This man's made a fool out of it, and he doesn't even know it. And you certainly don't want your relatives doing this. This is why one of the main things we do when we are purchasing a used car is we pull out the dipstick, baby. You got to check the dipstick. And when I check the dipstick, the first thing I'm looking for is how much oil is in that vehicle. And then the next thing I'm doing with the dipstick is I'm literally smelling the dipstick. I want to smell what that oil smells like. Also, I'll take off the oil fill cap and look inside of it, see if there's crud, see if that is smelly. We're going to pull the transmission dipstick. And a lot of cars today don't have trans dipsticks anymore. But when I pull the trans dipstick, what do you think I'm looking for? Metal shavings. Metal shavings, but it's hard for metal shavings to be on a dipstick. They're usually in the pan, stuck to a magnet. Pull the color dip the yeah, the color of the fluid, which I'm assuming to be pinkish. Also, the smell of the trans fluid. It shouldn't smell. Oh, trans yeah, Lucas fixed. Yeah. It shouldn't trans smell burnt. Well, trans fluid certainly shouldn't smell burned. It shouldn't have a burn smell to it. And I don't know about you, but when you were in trans class dealing with trans fluid, did you notice the fluid actually keeps your hands clean and kind of smells kind of good. Makes sense, doesn't it? So putting the wrong oil in the car is a form of deception. A lot of people will do this before they sell a used car. That's why, if possible, if I am helping someone purchase a used car, 
I always try to sabotage uh, the owner of the car. We try to sabotage it. And what do you mean by that, Mr. Young? Look, he wants to sell the car. And more than likely, he's not going to tell you everything about that car. Well, some do, but most don't. So to sabotage the car, I have to see the car run and start when it's cold. What do you mean by that? Okay, Johnny's trying to sell the Impala, right? It's a nice Impala. You want to buy it, blah, 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 2013 Impala SS. Hey, that's a great car. However, if we call him up and say, hey, little Johnny, we want to come over and look at your Chevy Impala. He says, great. When you want to look at it, you would say, soon as possible. And he will say, okay, come on over in about an hour. Great. And what do you think he's going to do in that hour? The car I don't warm the car up. He's going to start the car. He's going to warm it up. And think about it. A lot of cars make noise when they're cold, but they don't make noises when they're hot. Also, the tailpipe tells a big story when cold. Think about it. If you start a car and you see a lot of blue smoke come out of that tailpipe, what do you think you know? You're burning oil. You're burning oil. You're burning oil when blue smoke comes out. What about black smoke? It's rich. It's rich. What about nice puffy clouds of steam? Oh, you got a head, baby. You got a head gasket problem, and it's burning antifreeze or water. So I try to sabotage the guy. Once I figure out where the car is at, because I help the owner buy the car, the owner doesn't have to do anything. I just sabotage him. And sabotage simply means this. I get to the car before the guy has a chance to warm it up. And then I'll say something like, hey, I see you got this Impala for sale. I'd like to take a look at it. Okay, when would you like to look at it? Right now, I'm standing right next to your Impala. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll be right out. Got cash in hand, baby. And now when he comes out, I'll have him started. I'll have him started too. And I, I literally mean him. Because I want the hood open. I want to listen for noises and clack sounds while that car is starting. And I also want to watch the tailpipe to see what's coming out. So when I look at cars that people are thinking of purchasing, I always want to see this car start cold. It will give me clues and answers that I could never get if I allow that car to be warmed up. Whew. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Different type of thicknesses mean something. All right, let me head on back. And uh, I think we're almost done. We're getting there, getting there. A couple more things to talk about. Uh, my lab assistant is going to bring up a couple of things in a minute. 214, uh, 1214. I think I'm going to go to about, uh, uh, about 1230. I think I'll probably go to that. That would be a good number here. All right, let me uh, switch my screen around. Oh, what are you doing there, Mr. Young? Uh, I don't know. I got to switch cameras. I should do that first. Uh, switch camera. All right, there I am. Hey, what's up, boys? And then let's uh, switch screens. Let's do that screen. And then let's bring up the PowerPoint. Keep me on track. All right, you see my PowerPoint there, I assume? Yep. All right, cool. So there's that viscous meter oil bath thing that I tried to draw on the board. It's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Now, today's oil are what we call multi-viscosity oils. And today, guys, there's no summer oil changes. There's no winter oil changes. I don't know how to explain how the oil does this, but it's actually pretty cool. The oils that we pour in you your car today is both rated for summer use and winter use, where in the old days, we put in like straight 30, uh, which is an interesting question. So if you look at my Quaker State uh, bottle here, I've got 10 W30. So 10 means it flows like a 10 at temp zero. 30 means it flows like a weight 30 at temperature 210. So two different tests here. It's a blended oil. And so this one is W, meaning winter, of course. My question to you is, would this oil that you see right here go into your lawnmower? 
your lawn. No. Okay, why not for the lawnmower? Lawnmowers need a blend. Oh wait, it is. <laughs> why not for your lawnmower? Trick question, but it makes sense. It makes perfect sense when as soon as I tell you, you'll be like, oh yeah, it makes sense. It's too thick. No, because it's not too thick because the thickest part of this oil is weighted at 30. And would you believe it? Most lawnmowers today take a 30 weight oil. Hey, there's your hint. Because uh, you use it when it's warm outside. You got it. Hey, we have a winner. You don't use. You, you don't use your lawnmower in the winter, so it doesn't need a W for its oil. It's not a 10W30. It's a straight 30. That's I what goes in your lawnmower. lawnmower. Yeah, you don't <laughs> use your lawnmower when it's cold. <laughs> so anyway, the oil flows like a, like a 10 at zero. It flows like a 30. So this oil gets thin and thick based on temperatures. <clears throat> Pretty cool, huh? Excuse me. Now, look at this. If you have a 5W type oil, a 5W type oil, it will actually flow out of the bottle at temperature uh, 35 degrees below zero. 35 degrees below zero, a 5W will flow. Now, if you had this type of oil, your lawnmower oil, this is what goes into a lawnmower. It would be SAE 30, no W needed. Now, you let this get down to about 40 degrees below zero. And this will be a solid brick. This will be like ice in your freezer. It ain't going to flow. That's what I'm saying. So a lawnmower would be very hard to start at 30 degrees below zero, right? <laughs> all right, we know all the different oils. The only oil I left out of here, and there's some more, I suppose, gear lubes and things. Uh, but the only oil left out of my PowerPoint uh, here would be a 016. And I have a 016 in the room. I just showed you. I'm poured in a cup here. My 016 is, is going to flow at extreme temperatures. So in my day, the smallest oil I have ever seen, the lowest weight, in my day would have been about a 5W30. In my day, which would be uh, 80s. Then the oils changed to 520. And then, of course, we see zeros. Uh, the only zero oil I ever knew was Mobile One. When Mobile One first came out, they had a zero W30. And they got lots of zero oils in, in Mobile One. By the way. Hey, Mr. Right. So for a snowblower, would you use a like a five winner oil or something or what? Uh, I would think for a snowblower, they are definitely using a lighter weight oil. And I bet you it's a, a multi-viscosity oil which means it would be more like a 5W20 or 5W30, even though you don't need it for summers. Because don't, you don't ever see like a zero weight plain oil. I've never seen that. If there is, let me know. All right, all kind of tags on the oil, right? We know that they mean something. All right. We already talked about this, the winter and the summer parts of that oil. The manufacturers decide what goes in there, not you. And remember, on new cars, we're trying to keep your warranty. If you get a piston slap or something, I guarantee you they're going to try to check those oils and figure out what you put in there, and then they're going to they're going to make the claim uh, go away. You know that actually happened to my friend with the warranty. Really? Yeah, he had a, a newer Hyundai Genesis. You know the the turbo coupes. Yes, yeah, nice. Yeah, he didn't do his oil changes on time, like what the warranty said, and he actually got rod knocked from it. And when he brought it back there, they told him he has to pay for it because he didn't do the oil changes. <laughs> yeah, that's terrible, man. And you guys know you don't have to go to the dealer for oil changes. However, that little book there, that little book, you could literally write in when you did the oil change and what mileage, and that becomes a record. Although, what what record you try to write down in there? The record you try to physically write, that's a legal document, by the way. They're going to call you a, li a liar. How come? When you show them the book. Because the shop didn't do it? Mm -mm. They're going to call you a liar and say, get out of here before we call the police. Uh, they're able to tap into the car's computer and see when the oil changes were done and did you do the service buttons on them. They're able to tell. 
many cars there are. See, all that computer stuff is not necessarily our friend. <laughs> Computer's going to look if you get in an accident, man, a serious accident. Them insurance investigators, they're going to get to your car's black box and find out how you were driving uh, before the accident. So they'll ask you what happened. They'll record you. And then, of course, the car is going to tell them what happened. So you're going to say, I was driving 20 miles an hour and the kid came out and I hit the brakes. And then the car's computer is going to say you were driving 60 miles an hour and you accelerated. So, you know, watch out what we say, man. These computers are watching us. Uh, your car doesn't really have a black box, but all of the information that's going through those computers, a lot of that is held for a certain period of time. So be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Okay, guys, the next one is American Petroleum Institute. And these are the guys who rate the oils for what they can be used for. So the first guys were... SAE, they handle viscosity. These guys handle additives. They tell us what cars it can go in. And this stuff has been going on since basically the 1950s. So on your oil bottle, there is something there that tells us what it can fit in. You know, is it a spark ignition? Is it uh, this oil good for diesels? Is it good for this year car or that car? Actually, it's confusing. It's very confusing because it goes on and on and on. So the oil has um, a donut on the side. We're going to look at that in a minute. And that donut basically tells us what we can put the oil in. And some of these um, additives are supposedly secret. They got secret additives in there. And if you don't use this oil, it will affect your warranty. And then they've got all kind of trade names for it. For it. The biggest one um, right now, I think, would be General Motors. So does anybody know what General Motors' secret uh, code is? General Motors. GM. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's – when I show you the bottle, you'll kind of know. Uh, GM – on their vehicles that are basically, I want to say 2011 up, they have a code on the bottle and they say you must use this oil for their vehicles. And if it doesn't have this code, uh, it starts with, it's a letter. All right, I'll just pull it out, run out of time. Some manufacturers won't pay for it because uh, they're not paying for a symbol. But if, you're, or if you don't pay for it, you don't get the symbol. You see the green stuff there? You haven't heard of that? Dextose? Dextose. Oh, yeah, I see that. Fine. Okay, well, this oil is Dextose qualified, but this oil isn't. This oil is not supposed to go into a newer GM, according to General Motors. You see the problem you got? You're going to have warranty problems if you're not using the right oil. What is Ford's? What is what? Does Ford have one? Uh, I don't think so. Ford might say use Mobile One or, or Castro, oh. whatever, whatever it is they're saying. Basically, they are doing contracts with these people so that you buy a particular oil, make you brand loyal. Anyway, API service ratings have to do with additives in the oil and they put a donut on the side of the oil can or on the back of the bottle could be on the front we're going to look at a couple in a minute and they tell us what it can use for example if you went to napa and you brought this oil and it said sb sb is not to be used in any cars that we're messing with today oh uh, what do you mean well let's go back sb SB rating has almost no additives in it. An SB rating oil, that would be used for something back in the 1950s. So the higher, the higher the letters on the oil can, the greater or the newer the cars it can go in. Somebody had a question? Yeah, the, the oils back then, they didn't have as much zinc? Or is it the opposite, that they had more zinc than what we have now? 
Uh, I'm, I can't answer the zinc part of it. However, let me uh, jump ahead here. Because the higher, I'm sorry, go ahead. Because I know that like race motors, they ha they use oil that has more zinc in it. That's gotcha. why they use, that's why they use like uh, what's it called? Um, it starts with a V. I forgot what it's called. Uh, uh, I want to say viscosity improvers, but I'm not sure if that's. I forgot what it's called. The company that makes the oil is like oh, gotcha. Valvoline. Gotcha. There you go. Valvoline. Yeah, they're in the good racing stuff. All right, here. Look to answer your question. I'll answer it this way. Today's oils have additives in them, and it's the additives that go bad. So if you used an oil from like the 1950s, it, it could work in a 1950s car, but not in today's cars, because today's oils have this in it, anti-wear agents, which simply means there's chemicals or something added to the oil that reduces wear. We've got detergent and di dispersants. Dispersants is um, dirt will not stick with the oil. It keeps the um, oil, I'm sorry, it keeps the dirt suspended in the oil so that the filter can trap it. Everything likes to oxidize, oxidize like corrosion and rust and that sort of thing. So they have chemicals inside there that take care of these issues. So what happens? The older the oil is, these additives start to disappear. The older the oil is, the additives disappear. And you have to pour more additives in, which simply means change your oil. So when the oil, back in the olden days, you had oils that would go to basically look at this one. SH, this is compression diesel, SG, SF. These oils here, these correspond to probably the 1970s and 80s. Uh, look at this donut, SF. Okay, you're going to see why this is important uh, in a second here. Are you ready to take over, lab assistant? Yeah, I got some. All right, uh, let me get out the way here. Bring your screen up, and let's take a look at the donut. Let's take a look at the donuts you found. Okay, your question. So, on the oil that I bought, the Castro oil, right next to where I it put like the five W forty, which is what I put. There okay. Was, there was like a, a A3B4 right next to that. Is that the additives that you were talking about? Kind of like that. Code? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to look at it because uh, some of it I have to research. Like today's additives would be uh, the code. I bet you says on that. Can is it a uh, synthetic oil you brought? By the way. Yeah, full synthetic. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I would think the oil would say something like GF-6 or dash five. Mm, I bet okay. you that's on there. That tells me what additives are in that oil. Okay. If you look, I don't know if you have the can in front of you or the bottle. No, uh, I'm looking on their website right now. Oh, Just okay. Got you. It. Got you. So take a look at these. Um, these oils would be everything that you're showing me here is uh -huh. no good for today's cars. Oh, no. You know why? Because look, see where it says SL? SL corresponds to something 1998 and up. Today's oils have to say SN as in Nancy or SM as in monkey. This oil can be used in most cars today because it has the SN, which means more additives. Remember, the higher these letters go up, the more additives we have. So there, it will say something like SN and greater. It, will, it could say SM. It could say GF-6. <laughs> Dude, this goes on forever. It could say Dextose. Dextose is a full synthetic General Motors. And General Motors says, we've got special additives, and it has to say Dextose. But in reality is, there's some oils that are higher than Dextose that do not have the symbol on there. They like, we ain't paying General Motors for this. This is our secret. So different blends do different things. So my guess on today's cars, you're going to have to have an SN signature here or greater. Okay. And, and most of the time you should be in, into a full synthetic or a synthetic blend. Regular oils for today's cars are probably out of the question, guys, unless you're driving something older or the engine's got a lot of miles on it and you don't care. But as a general rule, 
you're going to be hanging right around here. 5W30, 5W20, 0W20 with an S, N, or greater uh, insignia on it. Thank you. You got any more there? or is that? Did, uh, can you show me the API Starburst? Because sometimes they don't put the donut on it. They oh, put sorry. the Starburst. And the Starburst simply means... Oh, no, that's not... Here. I don't know. I couldn't find this. Uh, just API Starburst. All right, I got you. <laughs> I bet you I got a picture of it on my... Uh, you want uh, no, no, no oh, Starburst on that. Yeah, there it is. Oh, okay. It just that's all it is. It's just this starry looking thing. There's it. So that is a more modern symbol, which simply means American Petroleum Institute has certified this oil. So you are always to look for the starburst. Now, once you see the starburst, you turn to the back of the oil to see if what the letters are, which should be S N or greater. S N or greater. Now, when you're dealing with uh, brand new cars, you really have to know what goes in because they may have a special blend that we talked about earlier. Uh, for example, zero uh, W16 uh, could literally be in there. All right, Michael, you can take it off. I'm almost done here. I'm going to hit a couple more slides and then we're going to do our tool of the day and practice pouring this oil out. We're going to see how that shows up uh, on our little test today. Uh, I'm going to present now, and I'll do that screen, that screen, and I'm kind of going to move quickly, guys, to uh, finish this up. There we go. All right, once again, the additives are in there. Uh, when you guys come into the room uh, tomorrow, I'm going to, I, I think I got some soap around here. We're going to do a dispersant test in the room. So tomorrow, when you come in, we're going to do a dispersant test in the room. And we're going to show you one of the cool things uh, that the oil can do as a dispersant. It makes dirt go somewhere else. And uh, you might find that pretty interesting. So all oils look for the API donut. And you could tell this oil is no good for what we want to do because it has the letters SH, which means spark. So spark means spark plug, spark ignition. And this means CD, which this has to do with compression diesel. And this oil being an SH is probably not what we're going to use in any of our cars. Uh, SH, if I go backwards, uh, let me go see when SH was good. SH was good back in 93 and 98. So we've got no business using an SH uh, quality oil uh, in today's cars. Makes sense, don't it? Look for the donut. A donut, you, this, um, this particular, this is not the donut, I apologize. Uh, this is the Starburst. It usually meant 96 and newer, but you have to flip it over in the back to see what the letters are for it. All right, synthetic oil is made in a lab. We're not going to spend too much time on that. I'm kind of out. But basically, man made oils. Uh, are they are natural based, but for lack of a better way of explaining it, they are able to alter the oils and make these oils do things uh, that regular oils cannot do. And so that's why this oil is what? How much more is this oil from a regular old quart? Right? You're probably spending $350, $4 a quart when you get Mobile One or Castro Full Synthetic, or whatever your favorite brand is. This is a superior oil. oil. So the best way to say this, guys, the first oil I talked about was good. Synthetic oil is the best. And then the stuff in the middle is called a synthetic blend. That's where they blend the two oils together. Each one uh, can do different things. And some of the things these oils are doing are actually a secret. Nobody knows what's going on. All right, I buy this oil all the time because I find it on sale. Sometimes a synthetic blended oil uh, is cheaper than the regular oil I, I buy at Walmart. So I do like synthetic blend, although I guess I should go synthetic, but I'm cheap. So in my Vovos, I usually put synthetic blended oil in there. All right, and that's it. 
Next topic would have been lubrication system studying this. All right, let's switch the cameras around here. And let's go find out our little experiment here. And then I'm going to do it exactly uh, the way you guys said to do it. And then we'll do it the way the bottle says to do it. And we're going to see which way uh, uh, works best. So let's flip that camera. Bring up this guy here. All right. And get out of uh, presenting. I don't need to present. Stop presenting. Okay. <clears throat> so I've got different stuff up here at the desk. I think I'll uh, turn the camera around on it. So you got to wait on me, guys. <clears throat> And I'm going to go with the way you told me to pour that oil. And then we'll take a look at a couple of the different oils that I have here uh, sitting in a cup. All right. Okay, so there I can kind of see what's going on there. Uh, back it up a little bit. All right, that should half work. So if we were talking about uh, viscosity, what number would you give this viscosity here? A lower number? Yeah, definitely got to be low because that's water, <laughs> right? That's water. All right, so this viscosity here is actually oil. And of course, it's thicker, so this will get a higher number. This is actually 5W30. Uh, All right, here we go, boys. Got my quart of oil. And when you are pouring oil out, the way the bottle is shaped, that if you pour the oil out like this, you actually create an air bubble dam. So the oil comes out chug, lug, 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 chug, lug, lug, chug, lug, lug. Chug, lug, lug. Chug, lug, 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 chug, lug, 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 lug. So we don't want the oil to chug, lug, lug out. Now, when I pour the oil like this, we now have an air space here. And that air space makes the oil come out smoother. Okay? Don't believe it? So let's try it. Okay, so which way do you want to try it? Let's see. All right, so what do you think? This way? No. See? Chug, lug, 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 lug. All right. Can you see that okay? I get, yeah, I guess we're seeing that okay. All right, here we go. Go sideways. Okay. <laughs> sideways. Chug, lug, 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 lug. Oh, man. So point is we don't want the oil to chug lug 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 because sometimes I have to pour oil in people's cars where I am not using a funnel for whatever reason and if you're pouring the oil chug lug lug and you're going to make a mess well look I think you learned something <laughs> pretty cool pretty cool pretty cool stuff all right let me turn my camera around we're going to talk about the uh tool of the day here did you notice how the oils didn't mix Wait a minute. Did, what do you mean didn't mix? The bottom part is still lighter from the pen. Oh, it looked it looked lighter from the pen. It may have been the way I did. Because I have to use this oil. I have to use this oil tomorrow for my oil change. I'm like, uh, it's got to mix back in there. It is two different oils, though. Two different brand names. I've seen I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, well, you, you know how... Uh, the high mileage oil they recommend it after 75,000 miles. Yes. Uh, what would you recommend? Like, would you do it or not? Nah? As a general rule, no, unless the engine's doing weird things like it's getting older and, and uh, I'm worried about certain things have an oil leak. High mileage oil for um, the best way to explain high mileage oil is they put seal expanders in the oil, a chemical. And what the chemical does is it takes the seals in the engine, mainly rubber, and it tightens them up. It swells them. And by swelling up those seals, you, you um, 
slow down on oil leaks. You slow down on oil leaks. And it does a couple of other things. Now, once you start using that oil, you should stick with it. Because if you're swelling the seals, okay, if the oil that you're using is high mileage and it's swelling the seals and it's making your engine last longer, let's say, or leak less, but then you go back to regular oil and then the seals shrink, you got a bigger leak than what you started with. So high mileage oil is good to take care of a problem. I wouldn't be pouring it in the car if I had no problems. That's how I think of it. If I got no problems, I'll stick to what I'm normally using. If I got a problem where I'm leaking a lot, smoke is coming out the tailpipe, then I might try this as maybe this might work. By swelling the seals, it may uh, help prolong the inevitable. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's how I see it. So, yeah, when you hit high mileage, you shouldn't just be pouring high mileage oil in there. The stuff you're using is probably fine unless you got a problem. Very good question, by the way. Very good question. All right. Today's uh, tool of the day is a pretty cool one. And I don't know if you played around or saw this when you were in auto suspensions class. So this tool here, here, I'll show you just in case somebody knows what it is. This is hanging up in our room today. No? All right, you may know this tool as this. And a crow's foot goes with it, different size. Inner crow's. tie rod remover. Yeah, this is called an inner tie rod removal tool. So most students are familiar with an outer tie rod, right? We make adjustments here um, when the inner is connected so we can change toe longer or shorter. And that's pretty easy to get off. However, when you are doing an inner tie rod, this is covered up by those boots, right? And there's a nut on the end here that locks this tie rod to the one I just showed you. So if I have to get this out, I usually have to use a crow's foot. And then this giant socket, which fits over the crow's foot. And then I'm able, it, well, it actually, it would be turned like this. I suppose it's turned that way. All right, there you go. This tool would fit over that, lock over the crow's foot. And then I would be able to unscrew this out of the rack. So today's tool of the day is an inner tie rod tool. The one you're looking at now is called a universal tool. And this tool here is the same tool, except it only fits one particular brand. I remember these as like Ford Tauruses, Ford Tempos, Ford Escorts, where the tie rod actually had a nut on the end of it. And we would use this super long socket to turn them out. So today's tool of the day, inner tie rod tool for removing inner tie rods. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. All right, guys, we covered a lot of material there talking about oil. And we could talk about oil for a couple of more days and lessons. It's pretty cool stuff. Today's engines have to have top quality oil. You just can't pour anything you feel like in them. And especially with new cars in warranties. Today's engines have smaller holes in them, right? Where the oil flows through the galleys. And those smaller holes and tighter tolerances require a thinner oil. So pay attention to what goes in your car, whether it's summer or winter. We need to stick with what the manufacturer insists should be going in there. All right, guys. Until tomorrow when you're in the room where we're going to do our Dis detergent dispersant test. I think you'll find that interesting. And that's one of the additives that is in the oil. And you'll be like, man, I can't believe it does that. And I can't wait to show you that little test. Any questions, guys? Nope. Ah, all right. I think I finished almost on time. All right, guys, until tomorrow, uh, 10 15, uh, we're in the room. Midterm test will not occur until Tuesday. So don't forget, Monday is a holiday for us. So midterm tests will actually be Tuesday. It's pretty easy. It's mostly safety and some automotive stuff that you should already know. So don't panic uh, on that little test. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow, 10, 15. No. All right, have a good day, Mr. Young. Yeah, thanks.